All right, so what, what I'm trying to do now in this presentation, thank you for, for sharing, thank you for participating. I think Lucas is not, not yet there, right? But I'm sure you, he will tune in in a while. Um, is uh, I tried to, I was asked to repeat a presentation I did in Spanish. Um, about Pietro Gasparri and also about um, the Pope, Pius XI. Both are playing a very important role in the line that we, we are seeing, seeing every time more clearer, which is the line, line of um, um, modern Babylon. All right. So in this line, we used to have a look specifically and foremost on um, another person. What other person was that that we usually looked at when we looked at the um, the line of, of of the counterfeit line, as we say it. I'm sorry, I didn't get the, the sound. Can you repeat it, please? Um, it is Pius the Twelve or Eugenio Pacelli. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. So this is the one that we have been looking at all the time. And um, oh, sorry, I'm just trying to get something in here. Give me a second. Uh, I don't know, I don't know how to do that. I just opened a new, uh, okay. So, there we go. So you are familiar, I guess, with this uh, graphic edit test did in um, the last presentation. And um, we basically had a look at, when we, when we look at this line here, which is the line of modern Babylon, we saw that the movement of 1899, which is the year when Eugenio Pacelli became priest, was anointed as priest, is the parallel of what we call all the beginning of the reform line, of our time, um, of our uh, reformatory movement, which is the Millerite movement. We used to call those lines reform lines, but uh, we recently came to understand it's not, not, um, not really um, a good term to call the line of Babylon a reform line. It is a rather a line that copies this year moments or phases or periods of gathering, 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 and scattering. So this is basically the concept. We used to have this reform line concept of the beginning and the end with specific way marks in its way. But here we, we don't have a reform line, right? We have a process that goes and continues and goes beyond one reform line. And it's rather a line of gatherings and scatterings. Okay, so this is the concept that uh, we see the Satan has been copying. And in this story, we of course understood that William Miller was the main figure the person who led out 
the line of reform. And in Eugenio Pacelli, we see his counterfeit. Okay. Um, and nevertheless, we now understand that the history of modern Babylon is a little bit more complicated. Why is it more complicated than the line of God's church? What does it make uh, more complicated indeed for the devil to repeat the same events in his church? Does anyone remember? Elder Tess um, pointed out a very important idea. Um, Brother Marco, can you please repeat the question? What is, what, why is the line of the counterfeit much more difficult or complicated than our reform line? Why is it, what makes it for the devil more complicated? I remember, to... I remember. <laughs> I'm laughing because I remember. Um, I wouldn't remember if you wouldn't ask the question. It says that Satan had to use the state. Correct? Satan had, use, Satan had to use the same, you say? No, state, state. Exactly. Satan has to yes. use the state. Well, Correct. State as so in Satan did have. Oh, okay. Yes, I got it. Sorry. So Satan had to use both state and church, right? Right. Right. While Correct. God only had to deal with his church. So to Correct. synchronize two contradictory elements, two very different elements, is. Um, is more complicated. You have to overlap them. You have to bring them together and make them work together. So this is also what we have in this story, other elements than we have in our reform line. We do not see every event um, present in both lines because simply the, the counterfeit line is, is different because of this added complication. So, what we came to understand is from the beginning, there was this relationship between Eugenio Bacelli, um, the leader or the head of modern Babylon, and we had Hitler, the leader of uh, the King of the North. But um, what happened now is that uh, recently we came to understand that there are other players in this line that are also very important. I just pointed them out here in the right corner at the bottom. And this is uh, Gasparri and Pietro Tacchi, Tacchi Venturi. Um, and then I don't know where it's written down. And we have on the, on the line or on the entity of the state, we also have this other person was is uh, of course Mussolini. Okay, so we had a look now on these figures, and my intent was to just uh, make um, bring them a little bit more to the forefront in terms of understanding and of knowing them. Who are they? Because it's much more easy to remember something and to understand the logic if you understand a little bit more about the people who are involved. So this was just the idea of this um, um, of this presentation. Here in this line, I did uh, a little, um, I marked that you have here a time period where we have this Pope, Benedict the 15th. And after his death, you have uh, Pius XI. So he is here from this time to this time, Pope. He's the follower of Benedict. And let me see if I can erase this a little bit here, just to make it a little bit more clearer. Um, 
there we go. So this would be uh, Pius the eleventh. So this is the one uh, here we have it in many ways. Okay. Um, so we'll have want to have a look at these these people, especially Pius eleventh and Gaspari. He is uh, working for both. Yes, he's he's working for Benedict the fifteenth for Pius XI and for Pius XII. So he's an important person for all this history here. He's not Pope, but he has, uh, he's the second man in the Vatican after the Pope. Um, all right, or oh, has been. Okay, so this is uh, more or less the setting, the general setting. And um, this relationship now, that we came to understand. We have the Pope, and he has a relationship with Mussolini. I'm speaking about Pope Pius Eleven, But he also established relationship, initial relationship with Hitler. But then we have the next Pope, Pope Pius XII, and he had established or he confirmed basically uh, the relationship with Hitler and Mussolini. All right, so Pius, he basically passed the way, <clears throat> so that um, Pius XI passed away so that his successor, Pius XII, could uh, establish their relationship. Okay. Um, now, who is this man, Gasparri? Yeah, let, let's start with Gasparri. Vito Gasparri, here we have him. And in this photo, you see him at the famous, um, how you call it in English, uh, treaty of, or let's better say it's other way around, the Lateran treaty of 1929. So I, I would like to give an idea um, of um, on how to understand this Lateran Treaty. Let me see if I can give you an, an image here. So here, you see a map of um, it, it, Italy. And on the left side, you see Italy in 1815. 1815. In 1815, what's in green are the Papal States. The Papal States take a big part of Italy. And this is really their, their nation. Yes, it's a state. It has big parts. The center, basically, of Italy, including Rome, is theirs. But you remember that 1798, there was the French Revolution. And at the end of the French Revolution, then you have the spreading of the revolutions or of the revolutionary ideas to many countries of Europe. In Italy, um, also sees a revolution in its, in its own country. And um, in consequence of this revolution and of the movement for uh, Italian Republic and Italian state who unites all the different single states in Italy, the Pope loses its properties. So you see here in orange, 
Papal States, 1860, lost to Italy, to the new state of Italy. And then you, you see still something in yellow around Rome, and they lose this also in 1870 to the state of Italy. So, um, of course, at this point, the Catholic Church doesn't have any state any longer. It still has properties, it still has churches, universities, etc., but it doesn't have a, a state nation any longer. And from this point on, the church becomes a big enemy of the Italian state, of the Republic of Italy. And it works against the idea of the Republic. It, for example, calls the, 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 the Catholics not to go to the, to the elections. So it really tries to harm the idea and, and, and it, it's an opposition to the new state of Italy. And this is, to take note, this happens 1870 when they lose this. So we have this, this long period here, 1870, and it's only in 1929, yes, which is uh, some 60 years almost later, that, um, no, sorry. Yes, uh, 19 years, 60 years late, right? Later, that, uh, that the church will have once more its own nation state, even if it's a very small state. Of course, it's just a few hectares. The Vatican state, it still receives a state. And the man responsible of accomplishing this is Pietro Gaspari. He is the man who is, um, who is responsible for this treaty. Okay. Um, there are many details. I don't want to go into all these details. You can, you can um, pick them up easily in an in a encyclopedia. So, I found just interesting in 1897, he is um, a apostolic delegate, something, this is something like a, a ambassador to Peru, Bolivia and Ecuador. Okay, so he is in South America. Um, this is an ambassador, but he is not recognized by the state. He doesn't have the the, the state recognition as an ambassador. There is a different type of ambassador in the, in the Vatican, which is called the nuncio, the nuncius. And this is this is a proper a proper um, ambassador. But this is something like an associate or a different kind of, of ambassador. So he has been working in diplomacy, defending the interests of the Vatican in these South American countries. Okay, um, and he climbs the ladder in the Vatican and um, under Pope Pius X, he receives a 1904 a important um, position. He is the secretary for the commission to uh, rework the canon. This is how you say it. Um, or That's okay, it's kind of. The kind of law. Yeah, this is basically the law that organizes how things in the church, within the church work. What are the rights? What are the responsibilities? What are the limits, etc., of the church, of the different positions in the church? Yes, and he's responsible to lead out this commission. So this is an extremely important uh, role, and you might remember this were from um, the study we, we did on, on or had attested about uh, Pope Pius XII, because he was also important in the development of the new canon law. 
So okay, so he 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 um, um, he's he's leading out this work. All right. Mm. This is here. So in 1994, he this commission is formed, um, and they work 12 years from 1904. They need 12 years, and in 1917, the new law is um, published. Yes, and Gasparri uh, is also. Um, he's very important in the in the elaboration of the ideas and of the whole new structure of this uh, new canon kind of law. Um, Eugenio Pacelli, here you have him. He helped in the development of this kind of law. This is something you might you might remember. He was part of this work. Okay, and some things they they uh, concluded. In this law is um, they um, basically two things that are, are very important is Rome becomes more the center in everything of the Catholic Church. We may think from our today's perspective it was always so, but it doesn't. It hasn't been so. Um, in 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 it in the whole time of the Catholic Church, of the history of the Church. Also, one part of this is that uh, the new canon law establishes that the bishops are established by the Pope. So what used to happen is that the states, for example, the state of uh, France, he would suggest and uh, the new bishop, if, if there was a new bishop to be elected in its, in its territory, and the Pope then would have to accept. Yeah, so the state elected someone according to his interests. So this now had to change and the new kind of law prescribed the idea that uh, this changes. These are very important and, and very difficult for the states to accept, of course, because they understood that they lost influence and power. So uh, basically one of the things that, that happened, it, that in order to accept the new kind of law, um, nuncios were sent out. In the case of Germany and Austria, it was, it was uh, Pacelli himself who was sent to these countries to negotiate. And who does remember what, uh, what was the negotiation between Hitler Germany and the Vatican in order to allow these new um, laws of the church, these new privileges, so to say, of the church. Does anyone remember? It, it was very complicated and contradictory. Yes. I remember. Okay. They negotiate the the political party of the Vatican in Germany. Yes, exactly. Its political party. Yes, Germany in its political landscape had a, a party which was a, a Catholic party. And the Catholic party was composed basically by priests, Catholic priests. So this has nothing to do with the church, but it was just a political party. But this political party was in opposition to Hitler. It was very influential, very, very important player in the time of, of, of the rise of Adolf Hitler. So the deal they made is that Germany would accept Catholic laws and rules and, and, and the wishes in order to uh, no, in, in interchange of the Catholics retracting from politics. So they had to promise this. And this was very bad because when the Catholic party retracted, 
Nazi, the Nazi party, which is called uh, NSD. Social, Social party, socialism party. Yeah. This is called National Socialistische Deutsche Arbeiter Partei. A good idea to abbreviate all these terms into NSDAP. National Social German Workers Party. Yes, this is the name of Hitler's party. So once the Catholics stepped down from politics, this party didn't have uh, enough opposition and it basically cemented Hitler's victory in, 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 the, in the elections. Well, this is part of the history. This is something to do with the new canon law. And this is something to do in somehow in the background with Gasparri, even though he was not um, representing the church in Germany. This was uh, the, 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 the work of um, Pacelli. All right, so I jump ahead a little bit. Mm. The problem here with this Pope Benedict the 15th was that the fifth time period. So we have the year 1917. What happened in 1917? Rose, are you there? Rose is not here. She's not feeling well. All right. I'm sad to hear that. Um, are Jacob and Francis there or not? Fine. Sorry? No, I don't see them online. Jacob and Fancy, they should be in Belize City, but I don't see them online. All right, so who wants to answer this question? What happened important for the, for the Catholic Church in 1917? What event? <laughs> Can you repeat? Is it 1970 or is it 1917? 17. Uh, we don't remember. So here you have it. The vision of Fatima? Yes. Oh, Fatima. Virgin. The Fatima Virgin, the apparitions of, of, of the. Yes. Okay. The, the happened in Portugal. So, this was an important event. And we understand that this event is a prophetic event for the Catholic Church. Okay. It is by Satan initiated and planned as a counterfeit to the works of Andrew White. So the church needed to accept these visions, but this Pope Benedict the 15th didn't. And what happens, he dies surprisingly. Yes, he just bum dies, it wasn't expected, he wasn't like, uh, he wasn't on the verge of, of dying. He just died suddenly. Well, and then we have a new Pope. So this new Pope here, so we all this story is uh, uh, about Gaspari, but Gaspari is behind the scene because when we have the, the death of Benedict the 15th, we have two... Um, we have two uh, fields or we have two groups in the church. One is led out by Gaspari. Um, the, the other field is led out by a Spanish um, cardinal, 
del Val. So basically, the cardinals are separated 50-50 in uh, regarding the election of the new pope. So they cannot advance. Yes, they cannot advance. So Gaspari then does something. He talks to this man who is also cardinal, but he is not important or he is not, nobody thinks of him as the future pope. But Gaspari talks to him, yes? And, and, and makes a deal. His name is at this moment is still Ratti. So Gaspari talks to Ratti, he says, me and my people, we will support you if you accept. So basically Ratti becomes Pope because Gaspari gives them the victory, yes? Uh, Ratti is very surprised, but he becomes the new Pope. And um, under his uh, leadership, now um, Gaspari, he works out the Lateran Treaty, okay? Now the Lateran Treaty is a very interesting thing because at this situation, we have this new Italy. This new Italy is led out by Mussolini. And Mussolini is a right wing and he kind of tries to impress Hitler. But in Italy, you don't have many Jews. You don't have the same situations in Germany. You have different uh, circumstances. And nevertheless, um, this, this man um, is very right wing, but he's also against church. And likewise, Hitler, he needs a church or the people who follow the church, he needs on his side. So Mussolini becomes interested in making a deal with the Vatican. All right, so this is, um, it, why it comes partially to the Lateran Treaty. Um, the Lateran Treaty, you see also Gaspacelli again, but this is not Eugenio Pacelli, this is his brother. Yes, he is a, a lawyer for this, um, for the Lateran Treaty. Um, so the family of the Pacellis, uh, so you might remember, they are, they are part of all this, okay? Um, Basi, what basically happens is that Gaspari meets with Mussolini and then he reports to the Pope. Yeah, so he's the middleman. And he's basically the brain behind this treaty. So Ella Tess, she marked this event as a very important event. It is the beginning basically of the, um, the gathering of the church. Not technically the beginning, but this is when you can see that the church is really recovering, yes? Because up to this point, the church was pretty weak. The Catholics were persecuted in many countries in the world. For example, in Spain, the Jesuit order was closed. For example, in Mexico. Mexico basically threw out all Catholics, all the, the closed down the churches, uh, closed down, uh, uh, um, put out all the, the priests, etc. It was a really uh, heavy fight, even in Germany and many other countries. So the church was pretty weak in this situation. And when it becomes in return now, a state once more, this is a very important sign. Nelda Tess uh, asked the question basically, so why don't we see nothing here in the reform line of the Millerites that is comparable 
of this event. And what was the answer? Hmm? What is the I think, answer to that? Go ahead. I think she said that was beat line and not everything with that we see on the counterfeit we will see on our reform line. Yes, but why? I, again, I think it's because um, the Satan has to use church and state to bring about his um, um, his his way of doing things. Exactly. Now, this is once more the, the, the solution or the answer to this dilemma. The deal with the state of Italy was a deal between church and state. You don't have this problem for Miller Miller. He didn't have to make any deals with the state, right? It was an internal reformation, a return, internal work in the, within the church. So he had nothing to do with the state. So for this reason, we don't have any comparable important event on that line. All right, nevertheless, we have an important event here, which is 1938, the Fatima storm. Anyone remember what, remembers what this was? And we see this in, in strong relationship to the falling of the stars in 1833. So the Fatima storm was a geomagnetic storm, which you could see from different parts of the world. It was very, very big. It was very, um, it was visible. It was a little, little bit strange, I understand, in terms of the time when it appeared. It wasn't expected. Nevertheless, there is scientific explanation to this, all right? But Catholics do not necessarily believe that this is scientifically explainable. They say it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonder. Yes, and they see, they take this as a wonder and they take this as an event that, um, that points to the end of the world. An apocalyptic event. Likewise here, Millerites also understood this was an apocalyptic event. All right. So this happens in the time of Pius, but Pius XI, as, as, as you remember, he rejected. No, 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 sorry. It was Benedict the 15th who rejected. Pius XI didn't pay much attention to um, uh, Fatima either, all right? He was not the big pope. The big pope who would accept Fatima was Pius XII. Yes, this is part of his success. This is why he, he, he could bring, bring in this or finish this scattering, uh, the scattering period. Now, he's basically patiently and partially not successful because he chooses basically the wrong king of the north, right? He will not give him the victory. Okay, so let's return to the document. Any questions or comments so far? No, we're taking it in for a good job. Okay. So now let's go a little bit to Pope Pius XI. Um, he, he's very, he was a very modern Pope. Yeah, he was uh, an athlete, he was a sportsman, yes, and he liked, he was interested in modern technology. So under his leadership, Radio Vaticano or Vatican Radio was uh, established, for example, in new media. Um, he gave actually the very first um, program uh, was with him. So he, he was 
been trying to be on the forefront of technology. He was a um, sportsman. He was a man interested in technology. And, um, and he was the first pope, of course, who was uh, leading out a new state, the Vatican state. Okay, so he becomes a very crucial figure. Now, what he does, as we mentioned before, he firms this Reichs Concordat with um, Germany, Hitler's Germany. The Reichs Concordat is this, um, yeah, this pact, this document who establishes the relationship between Germany, protecting of the Catholics, and the Catholics with Germany meaning specifically to protect from politics. So he did this, he firmed this, even though we have uh, Pacelli who was leading out the negotiations, okay? Nevertheless, what happened is that in 18, sorry, 1938, when we have the pogroms in Germany, or as many still call them, the Kristallnacht, Reichs Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. Yeah. Yes? Yes. When this happened, the Pope realized um, he didn't ah. want to support this man. Remy, do you want to say something? No, no. Okay, so he did not want to support this. And he starts to, um, to step back from the things or to repent, yeah? From the things he did. He also made a similar contract with Mussolini. And he also repented from that. Uh, we'll come to this in a second. So he is a very also not only only was he a sportsman and man a friend of technology. He was also he had three doctor degrees in philosophy, in uh, jurisdiction, canon law, and in theology. So he was a very very uh, scholar type of of person. Uh, he was specialized in manuscripts. Just my husband. And he became uh, the head of the library in Milan. And from that, Pope Pius X, he calls him to, to come to the library of uh, the Vatican Library. So he comes to the Vatican, Vatican State, and not to the Vatican State, to, the, um, to Rome because there still is nobody can stay, right? And so this is the, just in resume very quickly. As I understand, he was not a proper priest. Yes, he did not really do the work, the pastoral work. He, he became a priest, but of a church that did not exist. Yes, the, the Catholic church has this possibility to declare someone a bishop but the bishop must have been a priest. Um, and the bishop leads out a, a, a church or a district. But there are some churches, some church districts that don't exist. And these church districts that don't exist any longer are given to people like Rati. So they have the title, but they do not need to, to work in this position, really, actually. But being a bishop, he, be, he can become a cardinal, yes? So you need to be a bishop to become a cardinal. And the cardinal votes the new pope, the cardinal, that's what they do. So um, he became bishop, so he, he would become cardinal and then we heard the story already, he became the new Pope. 
when in 1922, Benedict XV unexpectedly died of pneumonia. Okay. Um, what Elder Test points out is at the same year that uh, Pius XI is elected Pope, Mussolini marches into Rome and basically received the government. Yes. So there's a, a link between those two in terms of coming to power. Yes, both come to power in the same year. We mentioned this, sorry, it was not, I made an error, of course, it was not 1938, but 1933, when we have this um, Reichskonkordat between those two countries, Germany and uh, the Vatican. Um, and then, no, 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 I, I was, I think I'm doing a mistake here. This is the Reichskonkordat. And here it was in um, 1937 when the Pope brings out an encyclica with big preoccupation was the name of the encyclica or with huge preoccupation. So he was worried about what's going on in Germany, very worried. And he expresses this. Um, and this, uh, the Germans are very annoyed. Hitler was annoyed about this. They destroy the, the copies of the material of this encyclica. So they, they, they felt kind of betrayed, but the Pope also had felt betrayed by Hitler because Hitler didn't grant Catholics all the rights that they had uh, promised. So here, and then we have in 1938, we have the Night of Broken Glass, yes. Um, and this is when the Pope really, really uh, repents of his um, deal with Hitler Germany. <clears throat> but in terms of, of prophecy, we understand that the Pope had to endorse Germany in order to become successful. <clears throat> yes, it, it, he had to, it was Satan's desire, was Satan's plan. He had to deal with the King of the North because the King of the North would help him to become successful. And this Pope doesn't do it. So he fails his mission basically. At the end of his um, lifetime, yeah, he fails and he retracts or he repents. Morally, we would say, yes, this was a very good decision. But in terms of the plans by Satan for the church, it was the wrong move. So after what had happened in Germany then in 1938, um, the Pope already made a discourse, yes, a little later, 10 days later, where he said that he was uh, not accepting that the Nazi claimed to be a better race. Um, there's only one human race, uh, etc. So he was really um, already you know, opposing publicly. But what he tried to do basically is work out an encyclica. An encyclica. against racism or on racism, yes. But this was a, a, um, a, a secret project, okay? So at this time, yes, now we have the geomagnetic storm in disguise in 1938. Um, and the Catholics call it the Fatima storm. Yeah, Fatima storm, Tormenta de Fatima, because they thought it was a sign of the end of the world. And it had been, actually, it had been prophesied by uh, the Virgin of Fatima. She had said, um, 
that this would happen. And then Lucia, when this happened, you remember the, the nun, she said, yes, this is really the, 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 the this is the prophecy, uh, the fulfillment of the prophecy. All right. Once more, we get back to the other note, just to have this visualized yeah, a little bit better. One comment, the Marco. Go didn't, ahead. Uh, didn't the Pope wanted the Jews to go down because of um, the economy? They were they were looking at at economic while they engage Hitler and Mussolini, but. Hitler and Mussolini were, were more racist and nationalist. Um, I never heard that. I, I, I come back to this in a second. Yes, I have a different understanding of the reasons. I just wanted to point out, we have this Fatima apparition here in 1917. Yes, then we have Hitler coming to power in 1933. And then we have the Fatima Storm, 1938. So things are becoming more intense. Yes. And, um, sorry. So when it comes to the question of the Jews, the Nazis had a conspiracy theory. Yes, about the Jews. It was just, uh, yeah, it was just uh, um, an object they would use to sell their ideas, to accomplish what they wanted. They needed someone to blame. The Jews just worked for that because supposedly they controlled the economy, they didn't let Germany recover from the First World War, and many other things. Now, for, for, the, for the, the Pope, well, first of all, Mussolini, there was only 3% Jews in Italy. Yeah, so there are not many Jews in the country. They are not an important, um, uh, they are not in percentage, they're not very many Jews. So he didn't really have a good argument against the Jews. He didn't have an issue with the Jews specifically, but basically he goes against the Jews because of to appease Hitler or to impress Hitler. Because Mussolini was a little bit seen by the Germans as, or the Italians were a little bit seen a little bit as like weak. Yes, uh, yeah, the Italians, you know, they 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 are not very strong. They don't have a lot of manpower. They don't have, they're not advanced in technology. Um, and he wanted to impress Hitler. He said, "We we 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 mean what we say. We we stand. Uh, we are in the forefront of." of of, uh, of this movement, etc. So the Vatican is also against the Jews, but the Vatican has a different issue. I understand he's a different line of thought. His enemy, first of all, is Russia. Correct? Russia. He understands this. We understand it's, it is the king of souls, of course, it's, it's its enemy. The Vatican knows this because of, as it is, they're called the secrets of Fatima. The secrets of Fatima explain that the church needs to uh, conquer basically Russia, consecrate Russia. So what does this have to do with the Jews? 
it doesn't seem to have a lot to do what but there is a conspiracy theory that Russia is connected to the Jews. There were many, many Jews in Russia, one thing. And the other thing is that the Jews and the Russia socialists are influenced by the Jews. Okay? So this was a conspiracy theory. Because of this, the Vatican is against the Jews. Uh, have you heard this, um, um, Raymond? Or, or uh, you think this might work? What's your opinion on that? No, first time I'm hearing this one. Okay. So yeah, this is a little bit of a problem because the, I mean, the Vatican, the Catholic Church was always against the Jews. They were against the Jews because they killed Jesus. Yes? Um, this is an argument they brought forth. This is an argument that Hitler also used. Now to Germany used this argument. They all the Middle Ages, they were against Jews. But they did not slaughter them. Yeah, they did not uh, kill them like Hitler did. They just restricted them, yes? They uh, didn't treat them as equals. They treat them badly. They gave them less rights and so forth. So they were enemies of the Jews anyways. But now in this new conspiracy theory, the Jews were basically the mastermind behind socialism. And therefore, the Jews became, became a new um, enemy. But it seems that um, the Pope Pius XI had a little bit his issues with this I, this conspiracy series. And as you see, he was an academic. I don't know how uh, he was. Uh, um, he was into books. He was into ancient texts. Uh, I don't know how much he really believed in this. He definitely had an issue when Nazi Germany became physically violent against the Jews. And this is when he retracted. And now I'm going to finish with this. Now he prepares the secret encyclica against racism. So, um, In this encyclica, it is secret, and he needs someone to help him write. So Pope Pius, he finds a man, an American Jesuit, which is called John Lafarge. And he, he, he asks him to come to uh, Italy. And in June 1938, they meet, and he explains what he needs. Why does he ask John Lafarge? Because John Lafarge wrote an article and he wrote an article against racism in the United States. And the Pope liked the article and he thought, well, this man is, is, is a good man for this job. So he asked John Lafarge to write for him the encyclica, okay? But there's another person, part of the whole story. This is Vladimir Ledochowski. Vladimir Lidochowski, he is the general, the general of the Jesuits, the leader of the Jesuit order. And of course, John Lafarge has to report to his leader because it's like a military organization in terms of organization. Yes? So Vladimir, Vladimir Lidochowski, so what he says, he promises the Pope that he will support this secret uh, plan. And when John Lafarge finishes his document, he gives it to Vladimir. In Vladimir, what does he do? He hides the document and he doesn't give it to the Pope. He doesn't give the document to the Pope, the manuscript. The thing is, 
that uh, Vladimir was anti-Semite and he had this conspiracy in order to block Lafarge's job. Okay. So this is really important because the Pope was getting, um, he was not very strong physically. Yes, he, he could not speak very loud anymore. He was getting older, he was getting weak, and the time ran for him. So finally, Lafarge, he learns of this conspiracy. He learned that the Pope didn't get the, the, the text. So he tells the Pope, the Pope tells uh, Vladimir. Vladimir says, yes, I'm gonna give it to you, but I warn you. And he doesn't give it to him. He waits and waits. And then finally, uh, at the beginning of the next year, he gives the documents to the Pope. So the Pope plans, he has to work the document a little bit, and he plans for the 11th of February um, to present the encyclica in front of the bishops. Okay. Well, what happened is that Mussolini had his spies in the Vatican, so he learned things, he knew some things, and he was very afraid that the Pope might perhaps excommulgate uh, Mussolini and also Hitler. Um, okay, what would be very bad for both of them because they still were not totally established in their power. Yeah, they were in the beginnings of their power. And they were, he was afraid. So he wanted to do something, but he couldn't. But what happened is then that the 10th of February, Pope Pius dies. Okay. He dies the day before that he would read the encyclica to all the bishops. Of course, there are many conspiracy theories why he died, how he died, etc. It was extremely strange, yes. But fact is, he died and he could not publish the encyclica. So, what happened is, who was in charge of everything that belonged to the Pope at this point? Who was in charge of the document? It was, it was a man that you know very good already, and his name was Eugenio Pacelli. So Mussolini sends an, um, a messenger to Pacelli and tells him to confiscate all the, 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 the printed uh, version of this encyclica. And Pacelli does this. He hides, he confiscates basically the document, the printed encyclica, and he doesn't publish it. He makes his own encyclica later. So we have this, this working out together, right? Of, of this story. And um, you can see this relationship of um, the position, the retracting, the stumbling, or we also can say the, um, the repenting of Pope Pius XI. But basically, it's, 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 he is stepping back from the plan. Yes, he's not finishing the work at the very end of his lifetime. Yeah. And this is why he had to disappear. Yes, he had to be removed. In the same year, World War II begins, but he, well, he dies a little bit before. And um, Pope Pius Eugenio Pacelli takes over as a new Pope. And as we already know, he, he stands behind Hitler. He stands behind Mussolini fully now. And uh, um, the story can continue. Any questions, any comments? No, no question. 
Uh, all we know is that World War II is about to start. <laughs> what is about to start? Uh, well, all we know is that this is telling us World War II is about to start. I'm not understanding the question. And me neither. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> no, no, you said it was in her comment. So um, no. I am saying the the line the line that said that is farming here is showing you also too that World War II is about to start. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. World War II. Yeah. Yes. This this war was necessary, right, for the King of the North. To kill the king of the south, but we are, we see that this is a disappointment. It doesn't work out, and it become then they enter the time or the period of scattering. Right. So Popeyes did everything that was correct, but um, it didn't work out. Yes. Correct. Um, and uh, well, but this relationship is interesting for us to see. Yes, this relationship that we have here, two uh, states that are conspiring or working together with the Catholic Church. And likewise, Elder Tess uh, explains that today we have Russia, but with Russia, we also have China. Yeah, both of them are, are working together. They are backing each other. They're helping each other. And they, um, it's the king of the south, but the other one is like the, the ally, yes? And uh, then again, we also have uh, here in this story, you have uh, Pied Pius the, the twelfth, who really finishes this work as far as he can do it. And he is then symbolized more properly by, um, as I understand correctly, by snow. Yes? Is this how you understood it? Yes. Yeah. So uh, let me see if I could say that in my own words. Um, so basically, um, Pope Pius XI would be like um, something like Miller and Pope Pius XII would be some like snow. It is, that's how I understand it because um, what happened with Miller is that at the end of, of his reform, movement right All he right. retracts yeah he repents he does not accept the the midnight cry message the midnight cry message yes which has to do here with the um, yes it's just not accepted mm -hmm. and likewise pope pius XI, he rejects the message right. or the yeah Correct? excellent right that's that's what i understand all right So I hope this has uh, has put um, into a proper perspective the important players here in this in this story. It's a lot of history. It's extremely interesting, and all of this became um, available because the Vatican opened is uh, Pope um, John Paul II. He he decided to open the archives. What? The, the Vatican works like this. The current Pope was in working, he decides what archives can be opened for the next Pope. Okay? So this Pope decides for this Pope. And uh, John Paul II decided that uh, the archives on the time of, of Mussolini and Hitler, they can be opened. But then we have uh, the important work of an American scholar. Um, 
I don't know if I have his name here. Give me a second. Hmm. There's this American scholar who was one of the first who took the chance and he went to investigate in the new, in the opened archives. Okay. Um, and he wrote a book on that. What he basically did is that he, let me put it like this. There was the States of Italy And this archive is open, yeah, has been opened. After Mussolini, it was opened by the new Italian state. So here you can find a lot of information because Mussolini, about Mussolini, because Mussolini had spies in the Vatican, yes? So you find a lot of information here but it's only from this perspective. It's only from the perspective of Mussolini, what he says, what he sees about or in the Vatican. Then you have the Vatican archives. And they were closed. Yes, on this history. But uh, Pope John Paul II opened his archives for the history of Mussolini. And now you see, when this happened, you see the perspective of the Vatican about Mussolini. And this is very, very interesting because what, what this man now did, is that he brought these two, um, perspective together, yes? So when you can now bring these perspectives together, you have a complete or more complete vision of what happened really in this history. Um, for some, I, 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 yeah, his name is David or David Katza, American scholar. This, the book is called The Pope and Mussolini. All right. So many of this information on the Pope's perspective on Mussolini, on the Pope's activities on Mussolini, etc. You, you, we, we came to understand through uh, this man. All right, that's all from my side for you and for us. We can close if there aren't any any further questions. Yes, thanks very much, Alan Marco. That was, um, although it was a re review, I liked.